All right, this is a video for lesson 8.2, Arithmetic Sequences and Series. So in the last lesson for 8.1, we looked at what a sequence was and how to find a term of a sequence using the nth term or how to find terms using the recursive formula. And we looked at adding parts of a sequence together using sigma notation. Um, this lesson looks at a particular type of sequence called arithmetic and introduces us to series. And we kind of saw series in the last lesson. A series is when you take terms of a sequence and add them together. That's just called a series. So what we need to do for this lesson is identify the nth term of an arithmetic sequence. We need to identify a specific term of an arithmetic sequence and evaluate partial sums. So we, we did see arithmetic sequences in the last lesson 8.1. They just weren't designated as arithmetic yet. Um, but an arithmetic sequence is a sequence in which there is a common difference, and we're going to call that common difference D between each term. So as a specific example, let's say we had the sequence 1, 4, 7, 10, 13. This sequence would be called an arithmetic sequence because in order to go from one term to the next, we add 3 every time. So in general terms, over here, Starting with the first term, if this is arithmetic, then I would add some number d to go from the first term to the second term, and then I would add that same number d, and then I would add that same number d every time to go from term to term. Now one thing to point out The second term, the second term here is the first term plus that common difference. Now, if I take that first term and add two common differences, That's going to bring me to the third term. The fourth term, if I start with this first term and add three of the common differences, like that, that would bring me to the fourth term. If I start with the first term and add four common differences, that brings me to the fifth term. So in general, the nth term here, which stands for any term, you can start with the first term and then n minus 1 would be a number that's 1 less than the nth term. So for example, a sub 4 means the fourth term right here. The fourth term would be the first term plus 3. Now this is where this n minus 1 comes from because 3 is 1 less than 4 times the common difference. And this is a formula we can use, this 
formula right here to generate the nth term. And this is our first objective. If you remember, identify the nth term. So given a sequence, we need to be able to identify the nth term just from the sequence. So two things we need to know are the first term and the common difference. So with this sequence that we wrote over here, the first term is 1, and the common difference is d. So using this formula, a sub n would be 1 plus And then n minus 1 times the common difference, which is 3. And then simplifying this, we have a sub n equals 1 plus 3n minus 3. And then a sub n equals 3n minus 2. Now this is a very common way of doing it using this formula. There, there is another way to come up with this nth term. And it uses more of um, an algebraic approach and this is something that we talked a little bit about in the in lesson 8.1. Arithmetic sequences, um, the nth term here we can see resembles linear expressions. So we could think of this as linear meaning mx plus b where the m, or slope, is the common difference. So if we looked at this sequence in terms of a function, now remember a function is an input and an output, and we talked a little bit about this during lesson 8.1, the input could be n, or the number, the spot that the term is in, and the output could be the actual term of the sequence. So for he this sequence, the first term is 1, the second term is 4, the third term is 7, the fourth term is 10, the fifth term is 13, so we could think about this sequence as a function. And we would need to come up with a formula for this function. Now, since it's linear, it has a common difference of 3. That common difference is the slope. So we know that a sub n equals 3n. Now, in functions, mx plus b, b is usually the y-intercept. Now, the y-intercept, if you recall, occurs when x equals 0, or in this case, when n would equal 0. The one issue is there is no 0 term of a sequence, but you can think of it this way. If there were a term in front of the first term, so the first term is 1. If there were a term before that, which we could call the quote unquote 0 term, what would that term be? And it has to follow the same pattern. It'd have to be 3 away. So that term would be negative 2. 
we could consider that our zero term or the value of b in this mx plus b formula. So the common difference was 3. The zero term is negative 2. So the nth term is 3n minus 2, just the same as we got using this formula. So let's see, we just actually did that one. So let's try a different one for practice here. Let's go, um, let's do, okay. So we need to determine if this sequence is arithmetic, and if it is, we need to find the nth term. Now remember, arithmetic means there's a common difference or that we're adding the same number, and it could be subtracting, it could be adding or subtracting the same number every time to go from term to term. So the difference between negative six and one is we're adding seven, and then we add seven, and then we add seven. So it looks like it is arithmetic, because we're adding the same number every time. This seven becomes our common difference. So now that we've determined it's arithmetic, we need to find the nth term. So we could do it one of those two ways. We could use the formula, a sub n equals the first term plus n minus 1 times d. So the first term is negative 6, and the common difference is 7, and we could simplify that, or we could use this idea of mx plus b right here, where m is our common difference, so that would be 7n, and b would be a term in front of the first term. If there was a term in front of the first term, it would still have to be 7 away from negative 6. So that could be negative 13. Now let's compare here if we finished this. And then we combine the negative 6 and negative 7. And we get 7n minus 13. So it truly doesn't matter which way you want to find this nth term, if you want to use the formula, or if you want to use the idea that arithmetic sequences have an nth term that's linear, and use this idea of slope-intercept form. They're both great ways of doing it. Hey, another one here. Um, part B, same thing, determine if it's arithmetic, if it is find the nth term. So the difference between 1 and 4 is we're adding 3. Here the difference between 4 and 9 is adding 5. And we're adding 7. So we're not adding the same thing every time. So this one is not an arithmetic sequence. Okay, so <clears throat> part C, here we're subtracting 4, subtracting 4, subtracting 4, subtracting 4. So it appears this one's arithmetic, so now we can find the nth term. The common difference is negative 4, and the first term is 3, so... If we use the formula, it would be 3 plus n minus 1 times negative 4. Or, if you wanted to use the other route, a sub n, this is common difference, or the, or the slope here. So it would be negative 4n. And then if there was a term here in front of the first term, it would be 
7, that would be our quote unquote zero term. So plus 7. If we continued this and distributed the negative 4, it would be negative 4n plus 4, and then the 3 and the 4 combine to negative 4n plus 7. So this is the, the idea of this first topic, finding the nth term given an arithmetic sequence. It's actually kind of two topics there in one. First, we needed to learn to determine if a sequence was arithmetic. This one was, this one wasn't, because it didn't have a common difference. Once we determine a sequence is arithmetic, we need to be able to come up with this nth term. The second topic of 8.1 is finding a specific term of an arithmetic sequence. Specific terms really can only be found using the nth term. So once we have the nth term, for this sequence I've got one, two, three, four, I've only got five terms of this sequence written. If I wanted the 50th term of this sequence, you could use this nth term and plug in a 50 for n, and you could rather quickly find that 50th term rather than having to write out all 50 terms of the sequence. So to find a specific term of the sequence, like I was just saying, it's easy if you have the nth term. So this nth term, for example, 4n minus 3, if you want to find the 20th term, or a sub 20, you just plug a 20 in for n and simplify, and the 20th term would be 77. Now the, the questions we're going to see are going to be a little more complicated than just using the nth term to find a specific term. We first have to determine what that nth term is from some information and then use that nth term to find a specific term. So we know two things. The 15th term is 49 and the 27th term is 85. And we need to find the 500th term. Now what I like to do for these kinds of questions is to go back to the idea that if a sequence is arithmetic, which this one is, to use the idea of function or input and output where the x column is the term of the sequence, so this would be the 15th term or the spot it's in, it's in the 15th spot, and the actual term of that sequence that's there is 49. So that would be, and then the term in the 27th spot is 85. Now, if you recall from any of your earlier algebra courses, the way that you find the slope is the difference the difference of y divided by the difference of x. So here we have y and here we have x. So the difference of y would be 85 minus 49 and the difference of x would be 27 minus 15. Now the reason I'm going to slope is going back to this idea that the nth term can be found using slope intercept idea or mx plus b. So first thing I'm trying to find is this common difference which is the slope. So 85 minus 49 and 27 minus 15. Just need to simplify that. So 27 minus 15, that's going to be 12. And then 85 minus 49, let's see. 
that's 36. And then 36 divided by 12 is 3. So between the 15th term and the 27th term, there was a span of 12 terms. And then those terms changed from 45 or 49 to 85, so that changed by 36. So 36 divided by 12 is 3. So the common difference. The common difference is 3. So we know part of our nth term is a sub n equals 3n. Now, we don't know this value yet. And the way we've been doing it in the last couple of examples is this value, if we want to relate it to mx plus b, b was that quote unquote zero term or the term when n would be zero or the like y-intercept, however you want to think about it. All we know is the 15th term and the 27th term. We do know the common difference is three. So if you wanted to take the time, you could count backwards. If the 15th term is 49, then the 14th term would be 46, the 13th term would be 43, the 12th term would be 40, 37. That's, that's a possibility. It could take some time, especially if, let's say we didn't start with the 15th term, let's say we started with the 40th term or something like that. It could take some time to go all the way down to when n would equal zero. There could be a, a quicker way here. I'm going to go ahead and put a question mark. So in this formula, we have three variables. We have a sub n, we have n, and we have that unknown value. You can't solve an equation if it has three variables. You can only solve an equation if it has one. So what we could do is plug in values for a sub n and n and plug in known values. a sub n is something from this column and n is something from this column. So just plug in something you know like this combination right here when n equals 15, a sub n is 49. So you could plug in a 49 equals 3 times 15 and that would give us that unknown value there because that's the only remaining variable. 3 times 15 is 45. Oops, 49. And if you subtract 45 on both sides, you get 4. So we know the nth term now is 3n plus 4. And now that we have the nth term, we can use that to find the 500th term. But before you do, it's always a good idea to check. This formula should generate the 15th term being 49 and the 27th term being 85. So let's just check. If n equals 15, and you plug in a 15, you get 15 times 3, which is 45. 45 plus 4 is 49. If n equals 27, we should get 85. So 27 times 3, let's see, that's 81. And then 81 plus 4 is 85. So looks like this nth term is the right formula to generate the information here. So we can use it to find the 500th term if we just plug in the 500 for n. Five hundred times three is fifteen hundred plus four, so the five hundredth term one thousand five hundred and four.
This is kind of a spin of the problem is to find the number of terms of a finite arithmetic sequence. So usually when we write a sequence, there's a dot, dot, dot indicating that the sequence goes on forever and ever. It's infinite. This one, finite, means it has a beginning and an end. So the sequence starts at 7 and ends at negative 113. What we need to figure out is how many terms are there in between that. There's five that I've written, but there's a whole bunch of terms in between that haven't been written. So we need to figure this out. Um, so it would be really helpful to have the nth term formula for this. So we need to identify the common difference first to go from 7 to 3, and then 3 to negative 1, and then negative 1 to 5. Looks like we're subtracting 4. And then if we wanted that 0 term, or the term in front of the first term, it would be 11. So our nth term is 4n plus 11. So what we're looking for is a number of terms. Um, specifically, if this is n equals 1, this is n equals 2, this one is n equals 3, this one is n equals 4, we don't know what one that one is. That's n equals question mark. But we do know that a sub n there equals negative 113. So we could plug a negative 113 in for a sub n and then solve for n and that would give us this n value here. And then divide by negative 4. So negative 144, let's see. That's going to be 36. So what that means is this is the 36th term. So total there are 36 terms of this finite sequence. Okay, so we're on to the final topic here of 8.2, evaluate a partial sum of an arithmetic sequence. So in 8.1, we talked about sigma notation. And this symbol here is sigma. It denotes summation or that you're adding terms of a sequence together. Uh, starting with the first term and ending with the fifth term and then you generate those terms using this nth term formula here. So for the first term, 3 times 1 minus 4, that give you negative 1. The second term is 3 times 2 minus 4, which is 6. The third term is 3 times 3 minus 4, which is 5, so on. So we, we add the first through the fifth terms together to get 25. That's called a partial sum. And the reason it's called a partial sum is we're only adding five terms of this sequence so it's a partial of all the infinite terms that this sequence could generate. 3n minus 4 could generate infinite number of terms, but we're only adding the first five, so it's a partial sum. The reason we're doing this again is we're going to look at a bigger portion of a sequence. So rather than adding the first five terms, what if we added the first 50 terms or the first 200 terms? Um, so larger partial sums. There's, there's a long way to do this, and, and then there's a short way. The long way would be if I wanted you, to, for example, to add the first 50 terms. You could write out all 50 terms of this sequence and try to add it up. That would take, that would take some time, but it's doable. Um, 
there is a story, and this this actually happened. It's not just a story, but um, we've heard the name uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss from the last unit. He's the one that uh, blessed us with Gaussian elimination to find the solutions to a linear system of equations. Um, so the story goes when he was in grade school, um, about seven or eight years old, the teacher posed this question to the class, find the sum of the first 100 positive integers. And uh, the teacher assumed that this would take the students quite a bit of time. Um, but as a young boy, Carl Friedrich Gauss was able to come up with the solution in a matter of, of minutes. Um, and it stunned the teacher and, and uh, wanted to know how he was able to do it so quickly because adding 100 terms together back, and it was a hundred, couple hundred years ago when they didn't have calculators, should have taken more than just a, a few minutes. So what Gauss did is recognize a pattern. So the first 100 positive integers, meaning 1 through 100, the first and the last term, the sum is 101. If you take the second term and the second to last term, it's the same sum, 101. If you take the third term and the third to last term, it's the same sum. The fourth term plus the fourth to last term, the same sum. So Gauss supposed that every pairing like that would be the same sum, 101. And if there's 100 terms, there would be 50 of those pairs. And so the sum of the first 100 positive integers is just 101 times 50. Rather than adding 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 individually, you get the same result doing simple multiplication. Now, I think, well, is that just unique to this partial sum, or does that hold all? By the way, um, a partial sum of an arithmetic sequence. When you start adding terms of an arithmetic sequence together, you get what's called a series. So this right here, negative 1 plus 2 plus 5 plus 8 plus, that's a series. This right here, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus eventually 100, that's a series. Um, so does that only work for this particular series, or is that a pattern that could work for all arithmetic series? It has to be arithmetic for this to work. So what if we tried this with the first 50 even integers? So 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 plus 94 plus 96 plus 98 plus 100. So that would be the first 50 even integers. If we took the first and last, the sum there is 102. If we took the second term and the second to last, it's 102. If we took the third term and the third to last, it's 102. So it looks like we get the same sum every time. And if there's 50 even integers and we paired them off like this, first, last, second, second to last, there would be 25 pairs each with a sum of 102, so the sum would be 102 times 25. So if we did this multiplication here, We get 2,550. So what this led to uh, Gauss's discovery was just the creation of a formula for the partial sum of an arithmetic sequence. The important thing here is it has to be arithmetic. But the sum of a certain number of terms of a sequence, that's what n is. This could be the first 10 terms. It could be the first 100 terms. 
um, but it's n over 2, so half of the number of terms. So if we go back, if we were adding the first 50 even integers and we paired them up, that would make 25 pairs. So that's where this 25 came from, and that was half of this number. So that's where this comes from, half of the number of terms you're adding together. And then this, a sub 1 plus a sub n, that's just your first term added to the last term of the series you're adding. So, and this formula only works, again, if the series is arithmetic. So here we're, we're uh, going to add the first 60 terms. And the terms of that series we can get with this formula, 3n plus 5. And the idea is going to be to use this formula. So the sum of the first 60 terms is going to be 60 over 2. So then the first term, the first term we can find by plugging a 1 in for n. That's going to be 8. And now we need the 60th term. And we can find that by plugging a 60 in for n. So 3 times 60 is 180. And then we just simplify. So 60 divided by 2 is 30. 185 plus 8. 193, so 30 times 193, let's see, Okay, last example, we're going to evaluate this partial sum. Um, we need to know if this is arithmetic. So 2 and 7, looks like there's a difference of 5. 7 and 12, there's a difference of 5. So it appears like we're adding the same number every time. So it's arithmetic. So we can use the partial sum formula what we don't know we know the first term is 2 and the last term of this series is 147 what we don't know is how many terms that is what is n so we had an example like this previously um, if we knew the nth term then we could solve for n to figure out how many terms there are of this series. So the nth term, if there's a common difference of 5, it would be 5n. And then if we had a term in front of the first term there, it would be negative 3, because that would have to be 5 spots away, or 5 numbers away. So it's 5n minus 3, that's the nth term. Now to figure out the n value, for that last term, we could plug in 147 and leave n as a variable. If we added 3 to both sides, we get 150. Divide by 5 on both sides, we get n equals 30. So it looks like this is the 30th term. So now we know the value of n, so the sum of the 30 terms written of this series would be 30 over 2, and then the first term is 2, last term is 147, so the sum of the 30 terms here would be 15, 
times 149. Two thousand two hundred and thirty five. And that should be really all the information we're going to need to be uh, successful here in 8.2. Let's just uh, review the topics. The partial sum of an arithmetic sequence. We can use that formula. It's half the number of terms times the sum of the first and last term. You've got to make sure that the sequence is arithmetic for that to work. Um, we talked about finding a specific term using the nth term. So this example here, if we knew the 15th term is 49 and the 27th term is 85, first thing we had to do was find the common difference using this technique we practiced was just using the slope formula, the change in y divided by the change in x. And once we had that common difference, we plugged in a value for n, we plugged in a value for a sub n using the given information to help us find that missing term there. And then once we had the nth term, 3n plus 4, we could use that nth term to find any specific term, in that case the 500th term. And we also practiced just finding the nth term given a sequence. So given this sequence here, for example, 3, negative 1, negative 5, negative 9, there is a formula we could use. First term plus n minus 1 times d. Or um, if you didn't want to use a formula, you could use the technique of thinking of an arithmetic sequence as a linear function. The common difference is the slope. And this value here would be the term in front of the first term.